Welcome if you're just joining us. We are getting set to start our webinar this morning on Palestinian protests and the future of Palestinian struggle. Um, if that is what you're here for, you're in the right place. We're going to give it another uh, minute or so for the room to fill. There's a lot of people joining us, so just bear with us. Be patient for a moment. Again, if you're just joining us, we are getting set in just a few seconds to start our webinar, Palestinian Protests in the Future of Palestine Struggle. Um, give us just a few more seconds and we will be getting started. Okay, so there's still people coming into the room. They may miss the introductions. Um, that's their loss, but we're going to get started for the people who are here now. Uh, good morning and welcome. I'm Laura Friedman. I am the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our webinar today, looking at Palestinian protests and the future of Palestinian struggle. This panel is co-sponsored with FMEP by the Middle East Institute and will be co-moderated by my colleague Khaled El-Gindi, Senior Fellow and Director of the Program on Palestine and Palestinian Israeli Affairs at the Middle East Institute. Some quick background on today's event. Uh, since the Palestinian Authority's killing of political activist Nizar Benat in June, Palestinians have been holding protests in Ramallah and other parts of the West Bank. The PA has responded with tear gas, stun gun, stun grenades, harassment of human rights defenders and journalists, and even detention of some protesters. Uh, one organization has described this as, quote, a concerted crackdown on freedom of speech and the right to peaceful protest. So just as these protests highlight deeper concerns among Palestinians about the PA and its leadership, the PA's crackdown on the protesters highlights the Palestinian leadership's own diminishing tolerance for dissent, as well as a deeper crisis of legitimacy. So uh, with that background in mind, uh, we are delighted and honored to have with us uh, a really stellar panel um, to help us uh, better understand these issues. Um, so we're honored to be joined uh, by Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, who is known uh, certainly to, to most of you, if not all of you, um, a long time and highly respected Palestinian leader, uh, as well as a, a prominent uh, advocate for uh, human rights, uh, quite consistently, and I would add, uh, regardless of where those violations come from, from Israel or from uh, the Palestinian Authority, uh, we're also quite honored to have with us uh, Fadi Quran, who is a, a prominent Palestinian rights activist, uh, who was actually among uh, the group of protesters who were recently detained uh, uh, by the, the PA and released shortly thereafter. You can uh, find the full bios for our panelists uh, on the landing page for this event on both the uh, MEI and FMEP websites. Um, and we'll also be putting in the chat box uh, their Twitter handles. So if you don't follow them, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, encourage you all to do that if you don't already. Um, and um, over to Lara. Thanks, Kyle. And some Last housekeeping before we get started, today's discussion, as always, will take place um, in the form of a conversation uh, led by myself and Khaled. We're going to be asking questions. It's being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. Uh, hello, everyone on Facebook. Um, in addition to our own questions, we encourage audience questions. You can submit those via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. Submit them at any time. We will be keeping track of them, us and also Fadi and Hanan. Um, so we'll, we'll be watching these. Do not put them in the chat box. We won't be watching the chat box. However, you should be watching the chat box for other important things, including like the Twitter handles, the bios, and also resources, um, links to resources that are mentioned in the course of the conversation will be put there as well. And finally, we have an enabled closed captioning for those who prefer or need to read rather than to hear the discussion. Uh, so that's all the housekeeping. Um, Hada, let's get started. Great. Um, so I want to start with um, asking our two panelists to help set the scene for us. If you could tell us a little bit about the situation today, are the protests ongoing, 
how is the PA responding? Um, and also what is the general public mood toward these protests and or uh, toward uh, the Palestinian Authority? Um, I wanna start with Fadi um, to get us uh, uh, to kick off the discussion. And if you could Fadi, maybe tell us a little bit about your most recent experience with uh, PA security forces. Thank you, Khalid, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you, and especially, of course, Dr. Hanan, who is and has been just a symbol of resistance and dissent for decades, and, and also a symbol of just struggling for rights across Palestine. And to kind of start in terms of what the feeling on the street right now, there's a lot of dissonance, right? Like today and, and the last three days, there's actually been a just flood of hope in the Palestinian street that's connected to the six uh, political prisoners that made it out of uh, Gilboa prison. And that has kind of, it's been symbolic because for many people it's kind of felt, and in many cases, not just symbolic, but people have felt imprisoned within a political structure that has been suffocating and kind of seeing these people, you know, these six prisoners get out of this kind of almost impossible prison situation has just led to people coming down. Last night alone, there were protests against the occupation, of course, but in about 12 different locations across the West Bank. And so you have that on one hand, and I wanna name that because it's something that's been happening more and more consistently. There was that same euphoria that built up in May, for example, with the Sheikh Jarrah protest and with, with kind of the global movement that happened around that. At the same time, of course, in terms of the, the situation with the Palestinian Authority, there is a lot of, I would say, and I would name it as fear because we have seen a continued escalation of repression not only the assassination of, of Nizar Banat per se, which was something that was just, um, I can't even describe the, the amount of kind of pain and also anger that caused in the Palestinian street, but then the, the follow-up efforts of you know, arresting activists, which is still happening, people are still being arrested um, for, for Facebook posts or for dissent significantly, although many of them are, are in many cases less known names, so it's not getting as much attention. The harassment of women, the spread of disinformation, the targeting of people's families. And so to name it, what the PA is trying to do is that the, the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian leadership today, the, the PLO's leadership, has lost, you know, it was built on revolutionary legitimacy. The fact that these were people that were fighting against the oppression of the Palestinian people, they've lost that for decades. There was some electoral legitimacy that existed in you know, the early 2000s for President Abbas. That has also completely collapsed. And there was a level of legitimacy in terms of the pursuit of a peace process and, and the possibility of getting a two-state solution. And that has collapsed. And now you have a new generation of Palestinians that are saying, well, these crony leaders who are basically profiting from the status quo, cooperating with the Israeli occupation, shouldn't be there um, anymore. And what I'm seeing is that there's going to be more and more in terms of the protests it's going to come as waves, right? People would like to see a straight line upwards. Well, actually what's happening is it's coming as waves and every wave is larger than the one before it in terms of protests against the, the Palestinian Authority. And so my sense is that we are going to see at some point a, a shift, a transformation in Palestinian leadership because of this continuous rise and increased quantity of, of protest and this anger with the Palestinian leadership. The last thing I will say though, is we are being blackmailed as a Palestinian people, because although the Palestinian people are willing to sacrifice everything for freedom when it comes to the occupation, people do not want to enter a situation in which you have some form of civil war. And what the PA and, and some militias connected to uh, Fateh and the security forces threatened with is that if this continues to grow, and they've told me this directly when I was in prison recently, if this continues to grow, then it will lead to bloodshed. And of course, as Palestinians, we don't want any internal type of violence um, to, to happen. And so I'll, I'll share bits, more bits about my personal story and what happened with me, but I think it's good now to, to move it to Dr. Ashrawi to speak further about it. Uh, yeah, if you could, Dr. Ashrawi, uh, uh, address the same set of questions and maybe also um, uh, tell us 
in your view, what's different, if anything, about this time versus uh, versus similar moments in the past? Oh, you're still muted. After all these years, and I still do it. <laughs> Thank you, Khaled, and it's good to be with you and with Lara and with Fadi and with the staff for uh, working with you. It's really a, a pleasure to address this topic because it's something that is timely and, and urgent, I think, has a sense of urgency and a handle on what's happening in Palestine. And I think Fadi really gave us a, a real uh, thorough uh, outline of, of the whole terrain of the picture of what's happening uh, in Palestine now. Um, and I, maybe I'll, I'll start where he uh, left off in the sense that this is not a continuum. Uh, it may be seen as, as sporadic as sporadic events like different intifadas, like different uh, uh, protests and so on. And they've been ongoing since the PA was set up, by the way. <laughs> but the thing is, with this sporadic and with the intermittent uh, uh, outbursts and so on, you still have an incremental process. And we keep saying we are in a state of transition. <laughs> we are transitioning constantly, whether it's in terms of the, the so-called agreement with Israel and we are locked in a state of transition or whether we are transitioning internally from one form of governance or government to another form or to uh, different sets of, of systems of control, but they have been changing. Now, this is not new, frankly. Uh, as you know, in 1994, I set up the Independent Commission for Citizens' Rights, which became an Independent Commission for Human Rights, uh, when the, the PLO leadership was supposed to come back and set up the Palestinian Authority. And I remember at that time, Yasser Arafat asked me, uh, don't you trust us? <laughs> I, I said, you need, you need a watchdog authority. You do need, we don't have a, a, a parliament right now and we do need to have certain guarantees uh, in order to protect people's uh, rights and freedoms. And we are a traumatized people under occupation. And the only authority we've seen is the authority of the occupation. The only gun is the gun in the hands of the Israeli soldier. So we need to take these steps and measures to protect the Palestinian people. And the transition from the revolutionary mode, which was, as, as Freddy said, the source of legitimacy to the mode of governance and setting up systems and institutions and so on. And at that time, there was a, I would say a, a great deal of optimism or expectation, or maybe at worst people saying, let's give it a chance, let's give it a try, let's see what will happen. Even though there wasn't that much euphoria over the agreement itself, but in terms of having the people come home. So the transition from revolution, arm struggle and so on to uh, governance, nation building, institution building was not an easy one. And it didn't have built in institutions. Mm -hmm. So there were many problems, many issues. And at that time through the independent commission and of course through my work with the leadership, I was always pointing out things. There were Journalists who were arrested, I'm sure many people forgot these things. Uh, when Dawood Kutab, for example, first broadcast the sessions of the uh, Legislative Council, he was detained for doing something that was his job. And so I had to go to Yasser Arafat personally and say, this is, you cannot detain somebody for, for exercising uh, his right. And it's our right as, as a parliament, as a Legislative Council to have open sessions. And that's what the law says. Anyway. So I can give you many examples. I, with the institutions I, I established, I checked uh, prisons. I followed up on uh, uh, complaints about torture and ill treatment. I even examined two dead bodies, uh, people who were killed in, in, under detention. So it's not new, but the context is different. That's what I'm trying to point out. Uh, the fact that trying to set up a system of good governance and respect for human rights and, and so on. Under occupation is not easy. The dynamic between the leadership and the people was not easy. Even though there was a willing suspension of disbelief when it came to the, the agreement and, and so on. But the, there was a willingness to forgive the earlier 
generation of leaders, not generation, set of leadership, because the PLO was seen, and I'm sure the new generations now do not remember or do not know these things. Fabian and his uh, generation have not lived through the period of the PLO as being, you know, I, I called them once, to us they were the gods descending from Olympus, <laughs> and we saw them as human beings. So they don't remember the halo around the, the PLO. And the fact that with Yasser Arafat and, and his uh, uh, colleagues, it wasn't easy to criticize them because they were seen as the leaders of the revolution, as the embodiment of our identity. So the degree of criticism was limited and it was from within us, from within people who were associated, let's say, with the leadership or with decision-making or with the parliament and so on. But gradually, as the peace process uh, of course, exposed itself for what it was, more as a system of control and prolonging the occupation and so on. And as the, the uh, PLO had became weaker and weaker since it staked its, its career and its future on an agreement and a peace process with uh, the Israelis, with an occupying power that had no intention of dealing with Palestinian rights or respecting them or accepting the right to self-determination and so on. So gradually, the, the whole situation changed and you ended up seeing more and more disgruntlement. The weaker the authority, and I don't want to go through every phase because there were many, maybe we can discuss this later. The weaker they felt, the more they needed the system of control to keep, all, keep control over the uh, public, over the street, uh, over public opinion. The more threatened or challenged they were, the more, uh, uh, I would say, closed they became. And we generated a, a political system that became less and less democratic, let's put it that way. Uh, and of course, the, there were other external forces that played a major role in the evolution of the Palestinian leadership and system of governance and institutional setup whether it's the Israeli occupation or the Americans, certainly Khaled wrote about this directly in book, or whether it's uh, the, the Europeans or the Arab countries, the Palestinian leadership was never a free agent. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, all these different factors uh, came to a head and led to a total disillusionment with the Palestinian uh, social, political, legal system not legal, I would say judicial. And uh, the more autocratic the, the leadership became, uh, it led to an even greater rift with the, uh, in 2005-06, after the election 2007, and the rift with Hamas. So the, the issue of security became important as an excuse for suppression and repression and, and suppression of freedom of speech and so on, because they were worried about security and, and the rift. And so there were other factors, internal and external, including this rift. And we ended up now with the generational factor, because now there are two generations, not just one, who do not know the history of the PLO, who do not know what was there before uh, 1994 or before 1988, they do not understand that uh, we are here in a phase which is not familiar to anybody, but they see only, not just the occupation, but they see only a failed political system. They see an erosion of their rights and freedoms, and they are extremely angry. And in many cases, they are not part of the political system of factions and political parties that have shaped perceptions and consciousness of uh, generations. I will stop here because there are too many things to address all at once. But I think right now matters are coming to a head. And I'll give you one example. Two days ago, uh, Abu Mazen uh, invited representatives, or one of his cronies asked representatives to go meet with him, representatives of civil society and civil society and human rights institutions, because I think they're beginning to feel, in a sense, insecure and threatened by these movements. And I'm not saying that this is the Arab Spring, I'm not saying that this is a movement that's going to topple down the system, but I'm saying that voices of dissent are becoming more vocal and they are not easily intimidated, regardless of the uh, repressive measures used against them.
Thanks. You, you both have given us a lot to work with, a lot to unpack further. I want to take a moment here and dig in to this, the question of this moment. Um, you know, here in the United States, we've lived over the past few years with the rising energies around Black Lives Matter and the spark of the George Floyd murder. And I'm interested, and, and Fedi, I want to start with you again on this one. To what extent, or, or can you talk about, you know, the Nizar Banat murder, you said this is this traumatic event. Um, you know, the fact that we're seeing, um, and to some degree, I think, since also an unprecedented domestic um, protest by Palestinians, not driven by, you know, a faction or led by a faction one against another, you see at this moment, can you talk about how much of that really is about the specific murder and how much of it is that this, this event, this, this traumatic event has tapped into um, deeper anger and frustration that is more, so what we're seeing is a moment in history where something, you know, the, the, something is tipped um, and, and what, that, what that means. So I'll, I'll start by saying, you know, the assassination of Nizar Banat was in fact assassinating someone who was speaking to the anger and frustration that society had already felt, right? One of the reasons Nizar was targeted was because he was extremely articulate. He spoke to a new generation. He had over 100,000 followers on Facebook. Millions of people shared his videos on WhatsApp, and he was speaking to, you know, um, stories about how Hussein al-Sheikh, for example, was a corrupt person and getting details, right? That there, there isn't a deep amount of investigative journalism in, in Palestine, but Nizar managed through his connections. Remember, he was formerly Fatah. He was actually imprisoned in Jordan for being a Fatah youth leader. Um, in, in his youth days. And so he could just speak to, to all the toxicity within the PA system. And because of that, and, and he was speaking to something that people felt, but many people either were too afraid to articulate or were articulating in closed rooms or were not articulating in, in a populist way, which he succeeded to do. So the assassination of Nizar was already a response. We felt as, as people who were his friends and people active in the street, we felt this was a message to say, wait a minute, we're not going to allow this momentum, this wave of, of frustration to be vocalized and come out. And we're going to show you that people who bring it to the fore are going to pay a price. And the Zara is going to be the person through which we, we teach you that lesson. And you know, remember the PA before assassinating the Zara had canceled elections where you know th there were a lot of questions about whether PLC elections, we had a conversation, I think, uh, you know, uh, Laura and, and Khalid separately about, you know, elections in, in terms of would they have impact. But the truth is whether or not, no matter how large their impact was, there was excitement in the Palestinian street that there was an opportunity for political change. You had over 36 lists. And so you have this all being built up. And remember, I think the generational point here is good. There has been a generation and the PA's rhetoric for, for decades was, you know, I call whiny rhetoric, which is the rhetoric of where's the Arab world? Where's the international community? Where's X, Y, Z? And why isn't this person coming to save us? And you have a new generation who through their actions on the ground is a generation of agency. You know, one of the, the posters that went viral at the beginning of the year was that, you know, liberation with our own hands. And the PA is, you know, what, the key difference in this moment, this is why I think it's a tipping point, is there was a discussion, I think, for the last two decades about the PA's role within society, which is, is the PA's process about pursuing a two states one way to liberation? You know, that was the discussion, like, is it the right or wrong way? Now the discussion has completely changed, particularly in the last six months, I, I saw a significant change, which is not, is the path that the Palestinian leadership is taking right or wrong? It's that the Palestinian leadership is an obstacle to liberation. There's no more, it's not an option towards liberation, it's an obstacle to it. And that's why I see now, Palestinians face a lot of challenges in terms of actual mobilization on the street. You know, the, what the PA tried to do, why I was arrested, was because they began blocking completely any right to freedom of assembly. Um, and they started you know, targeting uh, 
creating false videos of, for example, women, and I need to name this, you know, women were key leaders of the protests that, that erupted in the last two, three months. That's why the PA targeted them with fake videos and, and different forms of actions, because the PA knew, and they told me in the interrogation, when they interrogated me at 3 a.m. after I was arrested for organizing one of the protests, they were like, you know, the, the, the security person said, the leadership is terrified. They they think that within a few months they're going to be replaced. And of course, you know, the, the narrative they add to that is that you know Hamas and Dahlan and God knows who and everybody is going to join this movement on the ground to, to topple them. That's kind of the story they tell themselves. But deeply what they believe is that their time is up. And I'll end just, just so you know how different this period is. One key leader in the PLO who, who I know, a relative of theirs, and the relative of theirs asked him, this is a person very, very high up and respected, asked them, you know, what do you think is going to happen? And this, this leader in the PLO, basically to summarize what, what he said, he said, listen, um, we, you know, we, we failed in um, Jordan and uh, were pushed out. We failed in Lebanon and, and we, we were forced to leave. We failed, you know, we, we had to leave Tunisia at some point. We were about to be kicked out from there if, if Oslo didn't happen. And now there's a group of us that are definitely going to be forced to, to leave the West Bank. And it's because of our own failures and our own corruption. And I'm not repeating that narrative to say that it's accurate. I, I don't think it's accurate, but it's to put you in the mindset of some of the individuals that are currently running the Palestinian uh, political space, unfortunately. And so to end, I do think that the key question that we have that we're trying to answer is how can we create this new chapter of Palestinian leadership, of Palestinian liberation, of representation, and shift from the status quo without causing harm to, to the Palestinian people? That's the key question. If that question is answered, I think that the protests, this, everything on the street would in a moment transform the status quo. But I think the only reticence people have is not having an answer to that question. Even when I was in, you know, I, I'm telling you all these anecdotes because to me, this is the sign of the real change. Even when I was in the police station, when I was brought into the interrogation room, I told the, the policeman interrogating me, I will not be interrogated or answer any of your questions with the picture of Mahmoud Abbas hanging over your head. And the policeman looked at me and smiled and he said, I would love to take it down too, but this is not my office. You know, so even within the police, he began telling me that the anger and frustration with this crony leadership is it has reached its, its peak. So I think they've lost almost all support. And this is why it's scary because the, the violence that they're willing to inflict to keep control of what they have um, is also at, at levels unseen before. Thanks, Hanan. Do you want to talk at all about the sort of moment that we're in? What makes, what, yeah. why this is happening now and what it means? Yeah, as I said, it is incremental and at the same time, it is a tipping point because historically the failures and the repeated forging of any attempt really at creating any uh, political system that would survive all the, the means and, and oppressions of the occupation have led the Palestinian people to see that they were not uh, facing only the, the occupation, they were facing also a repressive domestic system and the insecurity of the leadership again is what he talked about. I think the key element, I think also was the rising uh, uh, recognition of the security coordination between the uh, Palestinian security forces and leadership and Israel. This is what struck I don't want to say the legitimacy, the credibility of the uh, Palestinian leadership. And we say leadership because I don't want to start defining who's what and what institution and what's the, the PLO and the executive committee and the government and the PA and so on. But there's a, a political culture that's a political leadership. And the security forces play a major role there. Okay. And they have Really, I, I will give you another anecdote like uh, Fadi, that uh, uh, once one of my uh, uh, interns or, or people who were working in my office was with, visiting friends of hers and the Israeli army in Ramallah, Israeli army walked into the room, into the house. They stormed in, they terrified everybody. They uh, beat up some of the people, they 
uh, arrested uh, a young man and a young woman. My uh, staff member was in the uh, bedrooms with the children who were also terrorized. And then they, they arrested the people and left. She was calling me on the phone and she was terrified herself and saying, the Israeli army is here, they're doing this and that. And we're in, a, in this house in, in Tira in Ramallah. And anyway, after they took away the two people they wanted, um, the Palestinian police came in, the Palestinian security came in and tried to ask them what happened because they had to report. So they kicked them out. They said, where were you when we needed you? And that story stayed with me. That's why when the, the uh, Palestinian security is supposed to protect the Israeli occupation army or the Israeli settlers and prevent anything from happening to them and coordinate with the Israeli forces, but they are totally incapacitated and, and prevented from defending their own people. This gradually built up a sense of resentment that this agreement has turned our leadership into agents of, of the uh, occupation and to protect the occupation rather than their own people. And that's how the leadership was being measured by external forces, by Israel in particular, by the US, even by the Europeans who seem to think that they're different, but essentially they're not that much different. So uh, th this led to a situation where the, uh, the killing, uh, the, the assassination, the murder, if you want, of uh, Nizar Banat, in itself is not unique, but in itself pulled lots of things together, lots of factors and elements, and said this is, they went too far, that now they're not just targeting, they're not just preventing freedom of expression and assembly and so on, they are killing people. And what happened afterwards was extremely serious because uh, when they started attacking protesters, and to me what was more serious was when they mobilized uh, Fatah youth and people who were working with them in order to attack the protesters. This to me was the sign of a new type of internal confrontation, much more dangerous, much more serious than even the rift between Fatah and Hamas, Gaza and the West Bank and so on. Because you are turning people against each other. You are tearing apart the body politic and the people as a whole. You are telling them that here we have one group that is defending legitimacy. And this is the key term they use, legitimacy. Huh? I remember I had a, a press conference with the women who were uh, beaten up and the women whose phones were, were stolen from them and whose private information was broadcast and so on was, was posted. And they said uh, in some ways that they were uh, told as though they were threatening, the, they were attacking the legitimacy of the political system that the legitimacy is now at stake, that they were defending the Palestinian cause. So even uh, going so far as uh, terrorizing, intimidating women, journalists, and the, uh, most of the women were reporters, by the way. And later on, they even dragged them by the hair when they arrested them after the, the uh, uh, third uh, protest march. So there was a sense of a build up of hostility towards each other, of a sense that they were being targeted, of a sense that we are not one people, which is what really made everybody angry. I was really angry. We are one people. Nobody has the right to, to separate us like this or, or to break us apart. No, and and the, what happened in May, this unified uh, uh, uprising, if you will, not just in the West Bank and Jerusalem, not just in 48 Palestine, but in Palestinians in exile and, and in refugee camps and Palestinians, and of course the, the uh, solidarity movement. This kind of unity, this kind of identification of each other emerged as a result of understanding that we are all being targeted. And that through a variety of means, the Palestinian people are being fragmented geographically, politically, uh, in terms of social justice issues, in terms of the, the uh, what we call Silm al-Ahli, which is domestic peace in, within our society, and so on. 
So the uprising is not to defend just Sheikh Jarrah, or not just to defend Silwan, which is true, not just to defend Bab al Amut and so on, not just to uh, uh, defend uh, uh, Ramallah and, and so on, not, not just against Israel, but it was a clear statement that regardless of the nature of our oppression and where we are located geographically, that we are one people. And this ironically happened as a result of all of the convergence of all these different forms of oppression that led the Palestinians to see and to understand that no matter what they do, where they are, Israel is on the attack. And even in their own uh, homeland, in their own country, they are being targeted. And therefore the only way out is through real unity and recognition of this uh, uh, national unity. So um, I'm saying this, this kind of liberation is a result, liberation of thought, liberation of identification and so on, is a result of all these matters coming to a head, but at the same time, you cannot take them for granted. It doesn't mean that there is a, a trajectory that is going to take its course. You may have, as I said, sporadic uh, and, and occasional eruptions, but unless we transform, and I said this in the old days of the Arab Spring, unless we transform the, the organization and mobilization in cyberspace into real organization on the ground to bring out the vote, to give voice, a voice and platforms to the new leadership, unless we together we work with the young we work to give them a space and room unless we all understand that uh, this type of, of uh, uh, separation and this type of autocratic system uh, systems will target all of us and we cannot in any way face israel and face the the occupation if we are uh, separated and so that's that's important and the real means, to me, the real means of change, we're not going to have a coup d'etat, is <laughs> going to be through the ballot box. I believe in elections. That's why when they canceled or postponed elections, people had a tremendous sense of disappointment and letdown. The excitement, regardless of whether you agree with the, the DOP or Oslo or you don't, whether there was a great deal of energizing uh, momentum that people felt we are instruments of change, we are agents of change, we can change. And the 36th uh, electoral list and the, uh, what was it, 389 uh, candidates are people who saw in themselves as powerful agents of change and they challenged and they defied and they wanted to, to run for office, to run, uh, to represent the people. And that led to another sense of, of disappointment. So as I said, there are many factors working together, but I think in the next phase, you will begin to see that the external forces are playing a larger role and are attempting to impose a sense of, I don't want to say stability, but quiet. And that's why they're trying to uh, prevent any further eruptions and trying to create some sort of uh, um, acquiescence. And that's why this new dialogue with civil society and with human rights organizations and uh, so on is beginning, even though people know that essentially in the real issues of the judiciary, of elections, of the legislation and the laws that are being passed, that there is no democracy. Um, if I could, I want to pick up on that point. Um, uh, Starting with uh, with Fadi, so Fadi, going back to the the question of Nizar Banat's uh, killing, um, we've seen um, so far the arrest of the fourteen members of the security forces who apparently were involved in, in his detention and, and killing. Um, why is that not enough? Why has that not led to an end to these protests? What what is it that these protests are aimed at? Is it bringing down the regime? If so, replacing it with what? I mean, how do you how do you have a coup under occupation or a revolution under occupation? Um, uh, and 
or is the is the answer to the question elections, like Dr. Ashrawi said, um, elections for what? Um, uh, you know, I'm reminded a little bit here of the one of the lessons of the Arab Spring is, um, you know, even though people can agree on the removal of uh, of a of a bad leader, um, uh, things very quickly fall apart if they can't agree on what comes next. Um, so tell us a little bit about what the ultimate aim of these protests uh, are in your view. Thank you, Khalid. That's, that's a good question um, and, and a big question. So I'm going to have to try to be specific and I think we can go into depth on, on each of those points later. The first, I just want to name, you know, why the arrest of the 14 people associated with Nizar's uh, murder is not enough. Um, Palestinians have a history, and, and Dr. Hanan can attest from her experience, of the judicial system not being fair or accurate or punishing people connected with, with the regime effectively. And in this case, the 14 people arrested, none of them are at the level of, of decision maker. And so, you know, again, this is not about just holding a few people in prison for a few years until anger dies down and then they're released. This is about ensuring that no Palestinian, a people who have spent over seven decades fighting to be free and not be repressed, do not want to live under a system and regime that continues using any form of repression or murder or violence against their people. And so it's not enough that just you know, these, this step is taken because the long-term, you know, and I think this is important to name here, Palestinians today want to live you know, within their homeland with freedom, justice, and dignity, and with the ability to define their own destiny, and with the ability to ensure that their children will have lives better than theirs. That's, that's the core of the struggle that we are in. And so the main, the main reason people are protesting today is they want to achieve that end goal. Now, in terms of how to achieve it, I'm, I'm going to say that there are many different paths that people are calling for. And, you know, th there isn't full on agreement. Some people are calling for elections, starting with, you know, presidential and Palestinian legislative council elections, and then moving to the Palestinian National Council. The idea being that all Palestinians around the world deserve to be represented within the PLO in a democratic process that ensures a, a shift away from the current kind of political calcification that exists. I think that end goal of, of reforming the PLO, kind of doing moving towards a constituent assembly for the new PLO, kind of like what happened in Tunisia in the early days where you had a constituent assembly that defined the new chapter, and then you had another elections that defined the people that would be running the new chapter. Like many people see that as, as an option. Other people are, are in the streets simply because they, you know, they would be happy with um, just a change of, you know, what, what I call the kind of trio of oppression that's on top of the political hierarchy today, which are Mahmoud Abbas, Majid Faraj, and Hussein al-Sheikh, you know, as, as three individuals that are part of a larger system, but that are really right now the people holding the system hostage and uh, using their power. And also Hussein al-Sheikh is very well connected to the Israeli side. He's, he's the person that coordinates significantly with the Israeli on the civil side. And Majid Faraj is, of course, funded um, by, by kind of the, the US and, and other governments as the head of the general intelligence here. And then you have a third question, right, which is, or, or a third level of asks, which is just um, moving towards key reforms across uh, the, the local legal system to ensure that people's rights are better protected, to ensure that women are not harassed at protest, et cetera. But where I want to go to, I, I wanted to name this broad spectrum to say that Palestinian voices, there are many different voices. I do not speak for all of them here. But I think where I can speak for, for all Palestinian voices is in terms of um, the, the question you asked about the Arab Spring. I think Palestinians have become wise, wiser from both our experiences with Intifada. Let's remember, after the first Intifada, we got Oslo, which, you know, as we're discovering now, was a travesty. After the second intifada, we got Mahmoud Abbas and 
you know, the increased security coordination with Israel, which for many people is like, you know, a travesty even worse than Oslo, having, having this guy be our leader and the type of system he's created on the ground. So what we're trying to figure out is, well, how do we have another level of uprising that can challenge the Israeli occupation, increase costs, build power on the ground, and create an organic new level of Palestinian leaders that actually represent the will of their people. And this is like playing 3D chess. And also, you know, a lot of this thinking cannot even be shared in public in this type of setting right here. And because unfortunately, you know, if we want to look at the status quo, and I know most of the audience here are American, if you look at the security forces that have been harassing Palestinians and maintaining the status quo, they've been funded by the US government. They've been trained by the US government. So there's there's no actual, apart from the US's funding of the, the Israeli kind of weapon industry and business with $3 billion, which Palestinians already criticized, the US is also funding the more local forms of oppression that we're facing. So getting into the details about how we answer this kind of chess game of how to replace leadership, challenge the occupation, build power, is, is again a big question and not one to be answered publicly here, because that's exactly what the PA and, and the current leadership is trying to, to crush. Um, but if anyone has ideas in the audience or, or from the people speaking, share our way, because the more the merrier, you know, this is something we want to solve sooner rather than later. Sort of like crowdsourcing uh, an uprising. Uh, Doctor, I want to put the same question uh, to you. I mean, in a way, you actually already answered it. Uh, that the, uh, yeah. the the key to fixing this problem is to is to hold elections. But I want to push you on that. Elections Not for, alone. Yeah, elections for what? I mean, if yeah. if it's just elections for the Palestinian Legislative Council. Does that really address, or even the Palestinian presidency, the, the PA president, does that really address these more underlying issues, um, given that the PA is not itself an actual representative body or a political body, at least it wasn't created to be such, um, but an administrative uh, sort of uh, experiment in, in, in local governance. Yeah. Um, so is, 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 you know, what does that mean to hold elections just for the PA uh, where does that leave the kind of political uh, uh, question of political representation and strategy? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And this is something that we've been discussing for a long time. When uh, they, they announced that there's going to be elections for the uh, uh, PLC, the Legislative uh, Council, and for the uh, president, the question was, these are... Uh, offshoots, the uh, products of the agreements of the BOP and the agreements with Israel. At the same time, there were many different political factions and parties and even the opposition and so on who said they want to participate regardless of where these uh, elections come from and what their reference is because they want to carry out reform within uh, the Palestinian political system because people deserve it and they deserve change and they don't have other means of change. But the focus is on the PLO item because the PA is a, a sort of service delivery system. It was supposed to exist only in the interim phase, as you know. The interim phase was supposed to end in 1999 and we should emerge into statehood and so on. So it was a transitional construct in order to see us through into uh, statehood and freedom. And of course, it turned out to be uh, permanent. That we are caught in a transitional phase that gives Israel tremendous powers and that uh, limits not just the freedoms, but the, the space, the movement, and everything that the, the Palestinian people and authority can uh, work with. So when I talk about elections, I think we have to put them in the national context. You cannot just have elections uh, for the PLC as being separate from everything else, or the president. I think we need to understand that there, there is a larger construct, which is the PLO, which has been weakened, has been enfeebled deliberately. I mean, there was a decision, as you remember, when we went to Madrid in 1991, that the PLO should disappear, that the PLO should not exist, because to the Palestinians, it represented the right to self-determination, 
and national identity and revolution and armed struggle and so on, it's long history. So what they wanted was to transform us into little village leagues where you can have your own uh, ruling governing body and you can elect your own uh, uh, representatives, but only within the uh, system, within the, the West Bank and Gaza, under the control of Israel, without any powers that have to do with sovereignty. That's why we need to take the, the elect, uh, elections as a means of transformation to uh, reform and revitalize and re-legitimize the PLO itself, because what it stands for is very important. It's not a series of institutions to deliver service. It's not the functional approach. It's the political representative party. And it has been weakened and it has been distorted and it has become almost useless. Now it's up to us to change it. This is one. But it's also important to understand that we need the judiciary. It's very important for Palestinians to feel that they can hold their leadership or anybody account. They can go to court. They can get justice. When the, the executive body, when the presidency took over the judiciary and passed, not only did they uh, uh, disband the PLC, as you know, so the presidency became the major source of legislation. They also legislated rule by decree, uh, uh, laws that, uh, that made the judiciary subject to the control of the executive. So you have collapsed the three powers, the three authorities, the judiciary and accountability are gone. The, uh, the legislative council is gone. The judiciary has become subject to the executive and the executive has been concentrated in the hands of a few. I wouldn't uh, excuse many of those around. It's not just that, you know, Abu Mazen can do better if he doesn't have these people around him. No, <laughs> there are three years that time for it, but there are also others who are enabling the system who are defending it because there are others who are also dependent on the system. And then maybe we should later discuss who is the opposition and what happened. Where is the opposition? What happened to the left-wing political faction? Uh, and, and how have they been co-opted in many ways and silenced? And where do the younger people go? Where does this young generation go? Because in the old days, you had people who uh, uh, had the, the political uh, agenda and literature. And if you wanted to join the Communist Party, the People's Party, the PFLP, the DFLP, you, sorry, <clears throat> you had uh, political uh, uh, awareness. Uh, you had political literature. So the people had a vision. The young people had something to look forward to. They had an agenda. They had a means of assessment, of analysis, of critical analysis. Now the opposition is fragmented. As I said, the older factions have uh, been dormant and they've been co-opted. And that's another topic we'll talk about this later. That's why when I talk about elections, I don't talk about them as the traditional set that came out of Oslo, but as elections in order to uh, re-empower the PLO, as elections in order to open the doors to enable these younger people and the rising uh, uh, leaders to have their say, to have a place. We were, we were really excited. I had sessions with young women who are amazing as to what it means to be a member of a parliament and how do you speak in public and how, but that, that was an instrument of change and it didn't happen. And then with the uh, uh, attack on the judiciary and now with the attack on civil society and the, a new law that was attempted to be passed to curtail the, the freedoms and the rights of civil society institutions, uh, things somehow came uh, again uh, to a head. But now the feeling that uh, you can take decisions and carry out change without outside interference, I think is, is uh, quite misleading because there was a clear decision articulated by the Americans that they want to empower now the PA and Abu Mazen. And they said this openly. And they talked to the Arab countries. And as you know, Egypt and, and Jordan have invited Abu Mazen and they're talking about this and how they have to buttress his rule because they need him. 
So it's not a matter of people electing or changing <laughs> their leadership. It's a matter of regional and global uh, factors and forces. Israel, Israel is a major player in our domestic politics. And we have to take this into account. So what do the Palestinian people want? Of course they want freedom. Of course they want rights. They want to be liberated. Of course they want to have a democratic system. They want to have their rights and freedoms respected uh, and they want reform and so on. But at the same time, when you ask them, when you start uh, trying to work out an agenda or a plan of action or a political program, it's extremely difficult. I worked with several of these lists that were running the, the electoral slate, and it was very difficult for them to come up with a political platform or program that would be seen as specific enough to be implemented and to lead to these great designs that we all have and want. How do you define freedom? Huh? How do you define what rights? Right to self-determination is not a right. Of course, it's a right. But rights under occupation. So the question is, how do you marry resistance to the occupation with the resistance to other types of oppression? which takes us to how the women's movement handled the uh, attacks on us when we started working and they told us you are hampering the national struggle, you are diverting us from primary issues and going into secondary issues. Now we have to marry all these different types of oppression and struggle against them together in ways that are actually quite specific and can lead to real change on the ground. Thank you. There are so many directions I want to take this. The, the question that I, I'm, I want to ask, and maybe this is more particularly for Fadi, is, and, and this was referenced before in passing in one of your answers, um, there is an interesting historical alignment of the, um, the outbreak of this kind of protest domestically inside um, in Palestine, and, and, and we're seeing around these urban apps more broadly we've been talking about and the growth of popular mobilization inside the Green Line uh, with enormous Palestinian support from the diaspora as well. And there has been, you know, there have been terms like unity and tifada and this, this, this sense of a, a cohesion or cohesiveness that didn't exist before in, in the demands for Palestinian rights um, that is not defined by the Green Line or by international borders. Um, and Fadi, maybe just from, from the grassroots organizer activist perspective, can, can you talk about this moment? Um, is, are these related or is it just by happenstance these are happening simultaneously? Or, um, and, and do they feed off each other? Do they compete with each other? Do they complicate each other, um, et cetera? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, uh, Laura, and I'm glad you, you bring it up. And, and what I want to say is, first of all, it's connected. Um, and most importantly, and I think this is the beautiful aspect of it, that this has been building up. It's not happening randomly, right? There was, you know, after, after different separate experiences, particularly over the last decade in Palestine, whether it's, if you remember in 2011, 2012, Palestinian refugees tried to march from Syria towards Palestine and, and tried to kind of come through the barriers and return. If you remember in 2011, there were uh, marches calling for elections, including PNC elections and unity. If you remember, there were protests all across Palestine against the Braver plan in, in the Negev, um, against that plan to displace the Bedouins there. One thing that, you know, as part of my kind of work over the last decade, just meeting with young Palestinians across historical Palestine and across the world, there is a new, and this is why I also feel this moment is different. There is a new awareness that has broken through the kind of containment policies that sought to fragment Palestinians into, you know, Gaza, West Bank, Palestinians within Israel, refugees, Palestinian diaspora. And that's slowly breaking down. And it's breaking down not through just dialogue, but through joint action. And one of the things that has become clear is 
even for Palestinians that are within the 1948 lands, within, within Israel, many of them were participating in the protests in Ramallah, were coming from Jerusalem, from Haifa, from Yaffa, from the Negev to participate in the protests happening in Ramallah. And the same thing when they were protests with, in Haifa, in Lod, and elsewhere. There are people from the West Bank finding ways to support the different families there, and sending and educating. And so why, why I think this is connected is because I think Palestinians are beginning to realize, again, we had realized this in the past, and I think it was some so our leaders sadly attempt to brainwash it out of our minds that we are stronger together than we are apart. And we were stronger in struggling together as one than we are apart. And it's better to have a joint strategy for all of us together than to kind of lead strategies piecemeal here and there in response to, to daily tragedies. And I want to name that at the same time that this is happening, that these networks are being built and learning to coordinate with one another horizontally under different severe systems of repression, the response from the PA um, and from the Israeli government and from the Israeli military right now is just brutal. Let's remember over 1,200 Palestinians were arrested within Israel by the Israeli police. Um, hundreds are being arrested in the West Bank. The PA, even before these protests began, uh, began arresting and harassing people who, for example, played a role in the unity uh, general strike. If you remember, there was a strike across historical Palestine. I was interrogated about that. You know, how, how did this happen? Who was responsible for it, et cetera, et cetera? Because they're terrified and it's sad, but the Palestinian leadership is terrified of what's happening. So it's a different moment, uh, Laura. And I think this is why everyone listening to this conversation should be very hopeful because this is something new that has been present in throughout Palestinian history, but kind of died down and is now coming back to the fore. And I also want people to realize that not only do, should we feel hope about this, we should protect it because this is a this is seen as a danger to the status quo within Israel that prefers Palestinians, you know, divided and conquered, to the Palestinian Authority that prefers the status quo and its kind of singular leadership to bringing all Palestinians back into the debate where they can't hold. It's a threat to Arab regimes, you know, from from the Emirates to Saudi Arabia to to Jordan and potentially even Egypt, because if Palestinians manage to create this type of global model of united resistance to challenge authority authoritarianism and colonialism and apartheid and it succeeds, it tears down the barrier of fear that these regimes have sought to impose after the Arab Spring. So basically it's only you know good people, maybe some of the people listening to this call are some of them that would really like for this model to succeed. The rest of those in actual power want to break it down. And that's why our key focus at this moment is how do you build power? Because we don't want to make the mistakes um, that were well-intentioned mistakes of the Arab youth across the region, where you kind of go into the streets, you have all these hopes, as, as Dr. Ashra always spoke to, of freedom, justice, and dignity, but you don't have a plan to ascertain them, and you don't build the power to make sure you can protect them. And in the end, you get stomped on and take two steps backwards. We want to learn and avoid that and, and move forward. And I think there's an opportunity to do that, but it won't be easy. Uh, thanks, Patty. Uh, uh, Dr. Ashtawi, I wanted to go back to something that you said, which I thought was quite pointed, and that is the Palestinian leadership was never a free agent. Um, I want to talk, I want to ask you a little bit about the role that Israel, the U.S., and the, the international community play in support of the PA. To what extent are the problems that we are talking about today um, structural or endemic really to the Oslo framework. I mean, we all know security coordination is really the central pillar of, of Oslo. Um, it is the reason that US and Israel support the Palestinian Authority more or less. Um, uh, and even uh, President Abbas has called it uh, a sacred responsibility. Um, uh, in addition to the fact that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a unique governance model where uh, a quarter of the national budget is spent on, uh, on internal security. So isn't there a kind of inherent tension between the PA's uh, uh, international legitimacy and its domestic legitimacy? Um, can, can that 
circle be squared in any way or uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, again, that, that's a crucial question, but may I just add something to the, the issue of the unity of the Palestinian people? Because to me, this is one strategic outcome of the many different types of oppression that Palestinians faced everywhere. So when you come up with a unified message and not with solidarity, but with real unity, it means they have bypassed the leadership. They have bypassed the uh, geographic uh, divisions. They have broken the, the sense of fragmentation and disunity. And a Palestinian in the state is very much a leader as a Palestinian in Jerusalem, as a Palestinian in Gaza and Ramallah and so on. So this kind of finding our voice and finding our cohesiveness and not just interconnectedness, but our oneness, this is very important for the survival of the Palestinian cause as a whole, because we were supposed to dissipate and disappear. Remember? Until now, there are attempts at saying Palestinians do not exist. Who are they? The negation of our very existence. This cohesion, this unity, this uh, commonality of vision and future is a sure guarantee that the Palestinians will prevail. Ultimately, the Palestinian cause will succeed. We are undergoing difficult times and circumstances, particularly because of all the conditions we're talking about. Yes, the PA was established, of course, uh, uh, as a result of agreements. And uh, the agreements uh, uh, in many ways wanted to maintain not Palestine as a place where you have self-determination and sovereignty, but Palestine, uh, uh, but the Palestinian Authority, they even refused to say the term Palestine. You remember the fact you were there. I said, Palestinian Authority is not a place. It's not a geographic location. We are in Palestine. But they, they attempted to limit the Palestinians to a certain territorial location with uh, self-government, what, what they call the interim self-government uh, uh, agreement, uh, interim self-government authority to carry out functional roles, but not to rock the boat. Now, if you look at the agreements and you've seen them, there were one or two paragraphs only on human rights, but there were pages and pages and pages of annexes and so on on security coordination. And the Americans in many ways did not uh, want to, to go away from or to depart from the uh, uh, Camp David Accords with Egypt, where we had autonomy remember, and there was a book, uh, as you know, on preventing the Palestinian state by our mutual friend. Anyway, they did not want to stay in any way to walk away from that agreement that Palestinians at best can have autonomy under Israeli sovereignty and control. And the land is very important. The PLO was supposed to disappear, representing a past and a history, and as I said, armed struggle and national identity. And the territorial and political uh, uh, and rights approach was supposed to be non-existent because we were supposed to be uh, uh, docile or tamed people under Israeli control. And we may be given some handouts. This keeps coming out, as you know, the whole issue of, as you know, Lara shrinking the, the conflict, the whole issue of the Jordanian role, the whole issue of uh, uh, turning us into uh, population centers under Israeli sovereignty. So it, it, it has never gone. The, the uh, economic peace that not only uh, Netanyahu talked about, but that now Bennett talks about, the word sovereignty is something that they cannot accept for Palestine because they want our land, basically. And that's why I keep saying, don't forget the land. They want the land to be a free for all. It's open for colonization, for annexation, and, and ultimately for ethnic cleansing. So it's important that uh, we understand that there are other factors at work. Israel has an agenda. The US has blindly supported Israel's military control and adopted its agenda. And of course, the Europeans were supposed to work with nation building and so on, but they also see Israel as a strategic ally. And they see Israel as a, an extension of their own colonial past in the region. I don't want to go into all these things, but we, the, the, any leadership that accepts the, rule of, the rules of the game, this game as it is played now, of enfeebling, weakening the Palestinians, of keeping them under control, of preventing any form of sovereignty, of 
making their land open to Israeli annexation and so on, and of preventing us from getting any rights. Living under occupation, as you both know, means that you have no right whatsoever, whether the, the right to live, you can be shot at any point and they'll get away with it. The right to freedom, you can be imprisoned at any point. Your home can be demolished, your land can be stolen, your children, be, everything can happen to you. And Israel is the prime example of impunity. It is the epitome of impunity. So we cannot question the tiny authority for acting with impunity and uh, uh, acting against the rule of law. So that's why I said the, the authority is not free. And even when it takes decisions, remember when the PLO, the Central uh, uh, Council and the National Council, we took decisions to stop security coordination. We took decisions that said that the interim phase is over and that Israel has violated all agreements. Uh, and therefore we are not bound by this agreement that Israel has shredded to pieces. When it came to implementation, they did not honor the decisions of the PNC and the, and the PCC, the Central Council and the National Council. So even that, even when the people speak, when, when we take decisions, we cannot implement them. Israel is not held to account for anything. It can do anything it wants. But should the Palestinian authority or leadership do anything that violates their responsibilities as per the agreement, all hell breaks loose. And they are you know, accused of all sorts of things. So within this, this configuration, what type of new leadership can act if it accepts these rules? So any leadership that attempts to make a substantive and substantial change has to break these rules and has to violate the rules and has to ensure that these agreements that were signed either Israel is to be held accountable and is not and has already destroyed them, or they cannot hold the Palestinians responsible for the safety of their occupiers and for the well being and the security of Israel. We as Palestinians are responsible for the security of the state of Israel. That is why I want to end on a good note. These six prisoners including my friend, because I was on the board of the Jenin Freedom Theater, Zakaria Zubaydi, who escaped the most secure Israeli prison, electronically controlled and so on. They gave people a sign of hope that once we decide and persist and do things, we can break through any prison. You don't understand how euphoric the Palestinian people are. They don't understand that political prisoners to Palestinians are really the, the most symbolic, the most significant leadership because they're paying a price for, for fighting for their freedom. And they are seen now uh, when they escaped, when they broke through, symbolically, this is a breakthrough for liberty, for freedom, for all the Palestinians. In every town, village, area, camp, you see celebrations, you see people handing out sweets, you see people running around with flags and singing and chanting. We don't see these as criminals or, or as they say, call them terrorists. These are the people who are willing to take this and they embody the human spirit when it wants to break free. And that's what I think collectively, and if you want in the abstract, what Palestinians want, they don't want to be captive to anybody, Israeli, <laughs> Uh, Americans, the Europeans, Arabs, they want to be their own agents of change and they want to bring around, uh, about their own freedom and their own different types of freedom also on their own land because we do deserve to have our land. And that's why I, I do have hope that all these may be symbolic, maybe little things, but they are coming to a head and they're telling us that no matter what happens, there is Palestinian unity, there is a Palestinian vision we just have to find the proper political, not just agenda, but plan of action that will get us all together. Uh, but one thing is sure, we're not going to surrender and we're not going to disappear. And Trump with all of his coercive measures and punitive measures and horrific uh, pressure and oppression on the Palestinians, did not, and this is one thing people, uh, by the way, acknowledge for, for Abu Mazen, that he did not surrender to Trump. That's one thing that they keep saying is his saving grace. 
but the Palestinian people would never accept uh, this kind of blackmail or pressure that was uh, uh, exercised against them. And so I think this is a new sense of confidence, a new sense of regardless of how difficult the situation is, generation after generation, that this is a struggle that will continue. And it's not because we want to struggle, but because we see the end objective in sight. Thank you, and uh, demonstrating the amazing skill of Dr. Ashrawi and Fadi, you, you both have managed to leave us, I think, with a sense of, of hope, which I think is incredibly valuable and for which I will say I am grateful. There's so much more we'd like to get into, but we are now at the end of our time. So um, on behalf of the Middle East Institute and the Foundation for Middle East Peace, I want to thank Dr. Ashrawi and Fadi for joining us today for this remarkable discussion. I also want to thank everyone who tuned in and especially those who submitted questions. If your question was not asked during the webinar, don't worry, we are going to actually give them in writing to the panelists um, so they can see what it is that people are interested in and that can inform them in the next time they speak or something like that. If you want to learn more about the issues we've been discussing here, you can follow our panelists and their organizations, check out their websites and on Twitter, that was all in the chat box. Also, the various resources that showed up in the chat box, if you didn't manage to copy them uh, while they were up, uh, those will all be linked on the web page um, along with this video. So you can look for this video online and find those resources. Lastly, I want to give a shout out for another uh, webinar that the Foundation for Middle East Peace is hosting next week entitled Nakba, Mob Violence and Inequality, the Past, Present and Future of Palestinian Citizens of Israel. Um, that will be this coming Tuesday, September 14th. Check the Foundation for Middle East Peace website for more information. Um, and you can go to uh, www.fmep.org and www.mei.edu to find out more about this event and other events and anything else you need on the Israel-Palestine conflict. We are a great resource, all of us. So with that, we will end. Thank you so much. Thank you, my co-moderator and co-sponsor, Khaled Al-Gindi and MEI. And we will close it here. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank it's you a all. pleasure to be with you all. Bye-bye.